Thank you, Steve. Uh, and hello, everyone, from the, on the other side of the coffee. Um, I have this thesis that in the future, everything is going to be tokenized. And kind of by definition, that means that the majority of things are going to be non-fungible then. We're going to have our stable coins, we're going to have some fungible stuff, but pretty much the rest of everything we interact with online is going to be a non-fungible token. Um, that might be, you know, bored apes, but it will probably be things like uh, digital twins of fine wines. It might be carbon credits. It could be um, digital race horses in a, in a game. Um, it could be all of the above and more. And um, I've actually got a really good tweet from Ryan Selkis from today, uh, literally from today. And for those of you who don't know who Ryan Selkis is, he's kind of the OGs of all OGs in this space. Um, Two-bit idiot on Twitter, if you don't know him. He said, today, NFTs are data wrappers. You can now transact any IP, synthetic asset, consumer digital good, identity token, etc., on-chain. They look like toys to start, but they are almost unfathomably important as a technical primitive. What a technical primitive is, is the, the, the most basic unit of all things that we will interact with online. I have one of the heaviest hitting panels, I think, of the day, and I'm really, really delighted to, uh, to introduce them because they all have um, very specific focuses on this future space that we're, um, we are already on that journey towards Web3. All of us will be at various stages of that transition, but we're all on the path. So um, we have Paul Bonham, who is um, GM for Digital Assets at the uh, ASX. Um, lots of news recently around that, um, which I'm sure you'll allude to. We've got Lisa, Lisa Wade, great friend of mine, CEO of uh, DigitalX. Um, Annabelle Simpson, who's um, Director for Digital Assets at uh, National Australia Bank. And last but by no means least, Shane Verner, who's um, Head of Australia and New Zealand for Fireblocks. So, um, if I hand it over to each of you in turn, please, just to um, say what your organizations are doing and your perspective on you know, the sort of tokenization of all things for the future. Um, and then we'll just, you know, freestyle, riff. Feel free to ask each other questions. I love that because that takes the, uh, the pressure off me. And um, take it away, Paul. Great. Uh, thanks, Robin. Thanks, everybody, for, for, for turning up today. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess at ASX, I guess, other than the last week when probably everybody would have sort of seen the announcements about, about the chess project um, being delayed, I've sort of spent the last week sort of explaining to people that, you know, chess was the app, it wasn't the blockchain, it wasn't the tech, the st tech still works, and every one of us and every one of our customers are sort of still building. But I said, you know, I totally agree with you about everything becoming tokenised, and again, other than the last week, all the approaches that sort of you know, I'm, I'm getting from, from our customers, and these are institutional corporate customers, is about tokenising real assets, whether they be funds, whether they be gold bars, whether they be real estate, um, whether they be obviously coins and, and CBDCs and that sort of thing. So I think totally agree that's going to happen. And you know, obviously we're working with us and, and, and partners and most of the guys here on this panel about you know, bringing that sort of stuff to life. Great, thank you. Lisa? Thanks, Paul. Yeah, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. At DigitalX, we, um, just in this space, because we obviously do a number of things, um, we passionately believe in the tokenization of everything and um, we are running some projects around creating prototypes of asset tokens and we've set up a real world asset tokenization fund. Uh, we also um, did a little trade on Symphony where we created a digital twin of our fund uh, just to prototype what, we, what it could, well, POC, of what um, tokenizing funds could look like in the future and how to use Symphony and um, how that can be a vehicle for Australia to really lead the way. So. I'll leave it there for now, but excited uh, I guess to so be for, here. For those that don't know what Symphony is, that's, that's the ASX's digital asset platform. Yeah, and we, we also have an SBF swear jar on this panel, so we're not allowed to. <laughs> Ten bucks, that's 10 and bucks. any time we do, <laughs> we're donating the money to charity. So, like, you can call us out. Hi, everyone. Annabelle Simpson from NAB. Um, I'm a director in our digital assets team. I do genuinely think I have the coolest job in the bank. But when it does come to tokenization, so my, ba my TradFi background is in liquidity management. So when I'm thinking about a balance sheet, I think, okay, 
in its fundamentals, what is it? It is a series of cash flows. And then once you put those cash flows on chain, you open up the entire balance sheet essentially to be tokenized. Um, so it's an exciting space that we operate in where, you know, we are, you know, we're the front runners, that's for sure. Um, but super exciting to see where we get with real world asset tokenization. Thanks, Annabelle. You might have um, the coolest job in the bank, but I met the person that's got the coolest job in corporate Australia, I think, and she might be in here. Elise is the MD of the metaverse at KPMG. Yeah, that's got to be the best. I want that title. Um, at at FiveLocks, we provide um, the plumbing, I guess, to enable tokenization, the, the secure infrastructure that enables you know, 1,700 institutions around the world and 91 in Australia, and, and, and we're working with founders and banks and the government and all sort of regulated and non-regulated entities across use cases that continue to, to stun my team and I every day. And I guess we're going to talk about a few of them. Thanks, guys. Uh, and I'm Rob Allen. I, I'm the SVP at the uh, HBAR Foundation, which um, is a pro provides grant funding into the Hedera ecosystem. Hedera is a layer one protocol. Um, but a future of tokenization isn't restricted to any one layer one. And we're talking about infrastructure here. So infrastructure at the basic layer is uh, for, for Web3, for tokenization, um, is needs to be interoperable. There needs to be gateways. We're talking about payment rails. So we need value transfer of these new types of digital asset, not just fiat currency representations, but you know, transferring my my NFTs, my uh, which are you know other other types of wealth. Right. So in the future, all of my NFTs are going to be, be repre representations of my wealth. How will I store that? How will I transfer it? How will I transact with it if it's even appropriate to transact? How, what is the legal architecture, which we've been just talking about on the previous panel? So I'd like to pose that question. The infrastructure, the interoperable uh, gateways, the wallets, what needs to be in place in order for that to be safe, secure, and, and uh, allow me to, to interact? And I think I'd like to reverse the direction. If we start, as I have, with the, 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 the blockchain layer, the distributed le ledger layer, Shane, what well, infrastructure needs to be put on top of that to make these things institutional class? Well, I guess it's the layer under that, right? It's, um, you know, you start with the architecture of what you're going to tokenize, what the end product is going to look like. And then, you know, in this blockchain world, security is critical and, and the focus needs to be applied um, from sort of every angle, right? From, from that sort of base plumbing layer, the, the stuff that we and others do, but right through that human layer, what that looks like. Because, you know, a, a token is a digital asset and sending a digital asset and, and storing a digital asset is, is critical to get right. And, and we, we talk in such broad terms here, you know, we could be talking about what the Tel Aviv um, Stock Exchange did, what's that, four weeks ago with tokenizing some government debt in a bond, you know, and that's, that's a groundbreaking moment, even though I think Sophie Gilder at Commonwealth Bank might have done it in 2018, correct me if I'm wrong, and sort of beat everybody to the march. But, but we're seeing that wave of tokenized assets. You mentioned a, 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 a horse race, curiously, we hadn't spoken about that. We're actually working with an organization that's tokenizing horses at the moment. And it kind of doesn't matter, but getting that security layer, getting that architecture, getting your plumbing right, we keep thinking of that, that base layer all the time and, and we have founders come to us and say, hey, I've got some funding, I've got a great presentation, I've got great people, we're ready to, to go and we sort of have a chat with them and they're a year off being ready to go if they're going to um, put everything in place to ensure they and their clients' assets are kept safe. I'll use this one. Um, so with these foundations in place, with the plumbing in place, as you say, and with this interoperability, interoperability that allows transfer of these assets, these new types of assets between chain, between uh, wallets, what are the businesses going to do with it? So Annabelle, what, what's your vision of the future where for the bank um, when all this plumbing is in place, the enterprise grade infrastructure for Web3 is there, what will you do with it? I'm actually going to deviate, in, as banks are very good at doing, away from the question, <laughs> Rob. 
But I'm going to go back. Okay, <laughs> Sorry, guys, Lisa, I am there. <laughs> I'm going to go... Something that's really important before we even start to think about the big build and the step before we actually lay down that plumbing and it's the education piece that's required at organisations like mine to actually start to implement that plumbing and get it right, explain why we're doing what we're doing with the technology, with this technology in particular. Like it's not necessarily the obvious answer for everyone that blockchain and distributed ledger technology is the solution for us to realise that future where real world assets are tokenised. So, yeah, sorry, pivoting so the question a little bit. Though, Annabelle? <laughs> We are educating our internal stakeholders to explain why this is the solution. Lisa, will you answer the question? <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to throw Annabelle into it. Well, I mean, it's really interesting because um, we, I, I think I can announce this, it's okay. We're a customer of NAB now, which is effectively a rebanking. And as customer to NAB, it's also important to express that demand and say, we are ready, we want to deal in this way. <clears throat> and so really the simplest level is I need to have the infrastructure that NAB can speak to, um, so therefore I need to set myself up as client to also be able to speak to NAB in a different way. So it's not just my bank account anymore, it's also where my assets are kept and how they're transacted if I want to transact with NAB. And I think a concrete example is we may have a bank account now where it's very public that we have um, same-day settlement for shares, which is really just me funding that, to Annabelle's point about the credit flow, that's me funding that in and out of my NAB bank account to client. And if I wish to, and I'm not saying we're doing it because we're all listed and that's not what I'm saying, if I wish to, be, being set up so I could transact with a stable coin to not only offer the client instant settlement, but then take that one step further and offer them the atomic settlement. And what that really requires is our basic building blocks to be able to speak to each other as well. Did that answer the question? <laughs> no. Rob, we don't have you. <laughs> Do you want me to make something up, Rob? <laughs> yeah. um, I think, like, I guess what, what I'm seeing and what sort of, you know, we're sort of seeing is the fact that, especially at this point in time, there's probably not going to be, you know, one blockchain to rule all blockchains or one protocol to rule all protocols. So, at some point in time, a, an asset minted on one ecosystem needs to find its way to another. To, you know, to Shane's point in terms, what's that plumbing that's actually underneath the blockchain that's going to move one asset to another because you want to use it as utility or collateral on a on a totally different ecosystem, right? So, you, at some point in time, you've got to trust, you know, either an algorithm or an intermediary to. You know, lock it and extinguish it or extinguish it over there and or remint it or reissue it over here, right? So I think, you know, really important that plumb and that sort of stuff we're thinking about now, right? Because, you know, the RBA's C B D C ledgers and Ethereum ledger, we need to get access to that C B D C into our ecosystem so our customers can use that in equity settlement or fixed income and all sorts of things. So we're we're looking at that layer as to how do we get stuff from one ecosystem to another, but they'll may you know, fix the double spend, make it secure, who's, who's that trusted intermediary or, you know, at the moment probably algorithms don't have a good reputation, so at some point in time, you know, it might be an intermediary to start with, but it may make its way to an algorithm in the future. Yeah, and then when, if you think about that on the really practical level for a company like us, who we are quite small, um, our dev team has spent a whole lot of time working with Symphony, which is on Daml, and then as a business, I then need to find the human capital to be able to operate on all these different networks and chains, and that may not necessarily even be the same human that works in our business. So there is just a whole lot of work that needs to be done at that foundational level. Great, thank you. Um, Paul, you mentioned the, uh, the DFCRC, CBDC, um, Alphabet Soup. Um, projects. Um, you left out the RBA. Uh, uh, for the RBA, yeah, I was getting there with, uh, with I, I could go on forever. The, um, they had 160, or I think it's 160 uh, use cases um, that were presented by not just, you know, startups. These, these are big organisations as well that, that had presented all sorts of use cases that could use a central bank digital currency. And you said it was an Ethereum one, but it's an, a, a private Ethereum fork just as a sandbox for the, the use cases themselves because they haven't backed any particular technology, and, and nor should they at this, this point in time. 
What was really interesting to me was that some of these um, these use cases used the CBDC, which largely um, across the planet are closed loop, um, private permissioned implementations of blockchains. Um, using CBDCs for to collateralize stablecoins, to bridge from the you know the wholesale um, centralized um, approach to, to digital currencies into the real world. And um, that collateralization via stablecoin actually that could quite easily be um, you know securities. It could be other other kinds of um, fractionalized funds. It could go for cross border payments. So um, we were at a, um, a round table that Steve organized with the, um, that team a few weeks ago. And an interesting um, point that was made by the RBA was that they didn't actually think there was sufficient um, cash in the system, in a digital currency system, to collateralize the demand that would be needed in a world where everyone wants to tokenize everything. So I think we need these foundational elements actually do need to be um, um, thought through, and this kind of careful approach that the DFCRC are, are taking actually makes uh, makes a, a hell of a lot of sense um, to me. Even though it will get closed down in whenever, it, yeah, April, April, or, April or so, yeah. So, um, Annabelle, I want to go back to you, having had some time to think about it. What does a bank actually do with my wealth when I consider my wealth to be? A digital racehorse, a digitized racehorse uh, that I play in a game, or I have, you know, a um, an identity credential which may have um, some kind of value. Is this something that you even envisage a bank being able to help me with, or is it just going to be tokenized fiat? I think potentially, yes, definitely. That's something that as a bank, as a traditional finance institution, we may play a role in. But where our role starts and where that's actually another player that participates and assists you on that journey, I think remains to be seen. Mm. We haven't seen where... We haven't really seen an example of it really well-defined where TradFi starts and where, you know, DeFi stops. And I think that, yeah, remains to be seen what that ultimate um, playing out of that circumstance will be. Cool. Lisa? I think there's a great article that our friend David Birch wrote, um, which is, do we even, will we even need money in the future? Um, because if you look at the way DeFi works with the rogue algorithms, but the great algorithms, um, there's this argument that says that every single um, token will have its own pre-programmed fungibility um, and we'll just be transacting um, against all different forms of collateral. Um, and, you know, if you look at um, our other friend, Brett King, and what he says about, um, you know, the first principles of money, really the first principles of money are um, store of value, um, access to capital and medium of exchange. Mm. And if you can actually draw a line and, and have, you know, if I'm willing to buy that micro microphone from you because it's tokenized for my sneakers, then that's a deal. Um, and, and we'll have those algorithms. So there's an argument to say that banks will just be, um, you know, NFT brokers, really, um, and, and facilitating that and running those algorithms. I mean, that's way in the future, but, you know, yeah. th that's a world that we could look at. And I suggest everyone reads that. And we article. can use the same infrastructure in real life as in the metaverse. So that those sneakers that you're transacting for my microphone will actually affect our avatars in our, our mutual online space. Well, it's funny because obviously Annabelle's got a great job but a very hard job and I know this. <laughs> um, but the the initial support that came inside of National Australia Bank came because um, Drew Bradford, who runs the markets business, his son had a pair of sneakers delivered to his house that um, he had traded in the metaverse and received this brand new pair of Nikes. And he was like, where did you get those from? And he was like, oh, I swapped it for three swords in the... <laughs> three sword tokens. And then all of a sudden um, there was that internal support from a senior executive that's like, yeah, I get that on a different level because if that sword is worth those sneakers, you know, it's really about Web3 or metaverse into the real world or metaverse into the universe um, that creates that fungibility. The ultimate so. crossover. So banks will be in the metaverse, right? So they'll have to transact in metaverse currency. Well, some already are. I'm pretty sure JP Morgan has a piece of real estate in the metaverse. So some already are. Yeah, that, that branch in Decentraland isn't a great experience, I have to say. <laughs> uh, Shane. <laughs> 
Jane, did you have something? No, no. Oh, no. So, uh, Lisa, and I'll, uh, you can have the microphone back in a minute, Paul, but I've got it now. Um, so, <laughs> I mentioned carbon credits earlier, and I know you and I have got this kind of, um, you know, real deep value alignment with um, how we tokenize uh, natural assets. And I've just come back from COP27 in Egypt, which a lot of the time I was talking to people about nature-based currencies, whatever that even means, right? Um, you are very much a driving force in the, uh, the carbon marketplace that, uh, that NAB was um, part of a consortium on. Would you like to talk about you know, carbon credits as tokens as well? Oh, it's interesting. I was also talking to somebody who's taking that to the next level um, and really um, it, it's the same concept. It's just um, being able to extract value from nature and carbon is the perfect example of that and placing monetary value on it for the good of the environment, really, um, which I think is incredible. I may have a side hustle where we tokenise impact, which is you know my passion because it's just that same concept of um, if you're willing to pay for it, then it's a transaction. And I think if we can start to extract value for the environment, which then funds projects, you can see I'm getting excited, <laughs> then, then that's really the game changer for all of us. And you know, one of the silly things that I thought we thought was silly this year was we created as a marketing tool um, these carbon koalas. And um, really, there were little NFTs where we bought half a tonne of carbon and then donated some money to the Koala Sanctuary in Port Macquarie um, to offset carbon at conferences and things like that. And last week, we did a, a wallet drop at a Citigroup lunch at Impact X. And now Citigroup Marketing are calling me saying, oh, we want to use this as a marketing tool. And, um, and I'm like, well, I'm not a marketing person. I just thought it was a good idea. And I think that when you can start to extract that value, then the projects get done. And that's a really great use case for everything that we're doing. True. And we're all marketing. Sorry, Paul. <laughs> uh, Rob, from our perspective, we're seeing um, the carbon tokenization market as probably the most um, aggressively pursued. Um, th there's only a couple that have, that have launched um, in, in the last year, but... I think we're talking to another half a dozen, and and it ranges from, you know, big organisations building a sophisticated marketplace to organisations um, tokenising accus and merging that tokenise the the accu price with agricultural technology sensor data and producing that in real time. It gets very sexy, and 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 the whole market is. Um, it's also avoiding greenwashing, which I, which I think is I well, well, it, jump and in. Yeah, it, it yeah, does no, and it doesn't. I was going to say on the greenwashing front because like at now, like I've got a new job and I'm a corporate that actually doesn't want to greenwash but I genuinely want us to be carbon neutral. I genuinely want Digital X to be part of this net zero conversation and beyond. And so recognising we tracked and trace the carbon emissions of our Bitcoin on the balance sheet mm. and we'll tokenise that. And then that's authentically, I'm declaring that liability. And so the whole world will be able to see how I deal with that liability. And I think that that's the other side of the equation to what you're talking about it, as well, and just getting rid of the greenwashing. It definitely is. And, and every corporate has got ESG responsibilities now. It's Absolutely. got obligations that it needs to demonstrate. And it ties into how much they can lend, mate. It goes um, beyond that corporate responsibility. Yep, yeah. yep, yep. But it needs to be auditable, it needs to be verifiable, and it needs to be ac accounted for in the same way as financial risk is accounted for at, at a corporate level. And you know, I've just spent two weeks in Egypt talking about this, so I'm kind of it's very fresh in my mind. The, um, we should probably have a whole panel on, on that, so we, let's not get off, off track. But I'm, I am going to give Paul yeah, the mic back. Paul, so from, a, from a, um, an ASX perspective, um, now Chess is that project itself is history, but you're still driving you know, digital asset solutions. I mean, it was one of the um, the, the, the hairiest of, uh, of initiatives in the Just really early project. days, right? So, you know, with digital asset and Blythe Masters and, you know, all, all the, the grand plans back in 2015 or 2016 when it started. But you must, like, like any kind of moonshot, you must have learned so many things on that journey. And now you've got a whole area that is that focused on digital assets. What, where are you taking it from here? Well, exactly right. I mean, and even I think just to talk about sort of, you know, carbon and obviously the clean energy regulator has its own tender out at the moment, which we're obviously in the last rounds of. And But to me as well, like, you know, it's a pain in the butt for farmers to, you know, get their biodiversity credits and utilisation of their, you know, non-farming farmland. So again, you know, to me, NFTs are the perfect model. 
for biodiversity credits, especially again if, a, you know, if, if by creating that the farmer can then you know have some sort of royalty so when secondary markets evolve and all that sort of thing they're sort of clipping the ticket each time which actually sort of offsets the cost of them getting it in the first place. So to me NFT style for carbon and biodiversity credits will be the game changer that you know, it liberates a lot more stuff out of the ground um, than it is today. But you know, it's, it's really for us, for us it's, it's the demand for the tokenization of real assets because it, the, the programmability of it and you know, the liberation of it and, and the, you can do way more with it. Um, and, and a lot of the customers are coming to us because they, they either want to get into new markets or you know, new people seeing stuff, sort of, you know, the Gen Zs, the millennials, you know, I've been in financial markets for, for 20 odd years and where do I go to go and buy a gold bar? I know, I, know, I know ABC Bullion are opening a, sh a shop front in Martin Place, maybe that, but you know, if I could buy a tokenised gold bar on BTC markets or something like that, you know, I can do it in the next 10 seconds. I think we, you can we may or may not own 15% of a company called X Bullion, so I can do that for you. <laughs> I was going to say, you can do it. <laughs> but is the gold bar a real gold bar? It really is, yeah, yeah and that's the beauty of it, is that, um, and this is where it comes to why... Uh, tokenizing real world assets is the institutional play because the way we do that is and I think Hannah Glass is here somewhere um, and it's almost more famous than anything is the digital twin concept and just the provability of that asset and using the data to prove its existence but also having the legal documents that sit behind it um, actually makes that the institutional use case because if you can prove it in the real world, you can then prove it in the token world and then we can do the reconciliation and do the work that we need to prove these use cases. And that, that goes back to that Ryan Selkis, oh, thank you for that, uh, Ryan Selkis um, quote that I started with, the, the technical primitive, the NFT as a technical primitive, actually means, and this is what tokens are, property rights, right? And because it's on a public ledger, you can prove immutably and without a shadow of doubt that you own that thing because you own the keys. So owning a, you know, Perth Mint being another um, um, kind of gold-based project or ex you can you can demonstrate that you have ownership of that thing that is uh, um, in, in the real world. And that follows with everything. Right, so every single token you have that property right, as long as it's issued on a public ledger and not, you know, a, a closed loop private ledger, it becomes becomes more hard. And then our wallets become the source of, of our um, wealth, and our wallets are the things which hold all of that wealth together, whether it be identity or all those that list of things that we that we said uh, would be the uh, the personal wealth of the future. And so, in the last five minutes, I quite like you each to wrap up with, you know, the the the, the most important thing you want to leave this audience with from your, your perspective or your organization's perspective or you know, just tell everyone what your favorite, your, your most valuable NFT is at the moment. Well, I think Rob, you made a good point. You, know, you use the term wallets, so that's, that's plural, right? So again, even go back to that gold bar, right? If you want to use that as collateral to you know, get a loan from Annabelle you know, and Annabelle's on a different platform or a different ecosystem, to get that plumbing right between ecosystems, I think, is... is something we really need to, to take this thing to the next level we've got to get that right because people are going to want to use the the assets they're accumulating on various different blockchains potentially if it's collateral you know to borrow some more money to, to buy the next nft right so to get that plumbing right such that you know a, a bank or, or or any type of lender you know can get access to that collateral and lock it all or what have you to get you a loan to get you to buy the next thing i think is going to be ultimately important for the industry are you extending plumbing to Regula regulation, regulatory oversight, even if it's a light regulatory wrapper, because I think that's an intrinsic part of... We, we probably should have had the swear jar on regulation too, should we? <laughs> <laughs> I guess, I mean, that's the other elephant. I mean, it'd be really, you know, I think, you know, what's happened over the last, you know, few weeks and stuff, and, and hopefully, you know, the regulators getting more in the room, and as you know, Steve's sort of told everybody, it's, you know, it's up to us to well, they have it's those not conversations. Be so, it's going to yeah. be 2023 now, so it's coming. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I won't go there because that will be a swear jar. <laughs> um, from my point of view, I would say for everything Paul's just said, it requires investment and we all know that um, you know, we're coming into probably a capital constrained environment and I think it's all of us rallying together to support the startup community and um, to really support the investment that's needed because we can't do any of this without money and investment and Australia has a real opportunity to lead. Uh, we just need to invest in ourselves and keep doing the work. So that would be my key takeaway. We need money to do all of this.
Thanks, Lisa. Needing money. You know where you can come to for money. Um, <laughs> no, I think... Look, final point that I'd like to say is that as, you know, a TradFi institution exploring this space, we do come at it from a place of humility and from a place that, you know, we do have a lot to learn, but also with the belief that the future of finance will be enabled through the likes of NFTs, through blockchain more broadly. And, you know, we're so excited to be a part of that big build. I think the future of finance in Australia will be led by the major banks and the staggering 160 use cases that the FCRC have, have got with the RBA now. And, and I think we're a nation of fast followers. You know, when, when the major institutions are successful in a place, we've seen ecosystems get built around them, but we need everybody to play, right? And I think we need everybody to play by the rules. Um, hence, you know, the R word, and I'm probably in for 20 now. <laughs> you can have a koala. <laughs> Great, well, thank you, everyone. I think mainstream adoption as we've said, is about interoperability because that's the thing that breaks down the, the walls. You know, we've seen it in um, seen it in the internet boom, we've seen it in the mobile payments boom, and now we, we're going to be seeing it in the tokenization boom. Um, that's what scales. That what leads. That's what leads to retail and mainstream adoption. And with the support of institutions that provide the you know the uh, the trusted framework and the and the regulation, as you said, because you know the last few weeks um, with SBF. Ka-ching! Um, which, um, means that it's, it's more important now than, than ever. Um, and regulatory clarity and the, uh, the Blockchain Australia initiatives that uh, are pushing that regulation, and Lisa's on, on the board of Blockchain Australia, um, should bring Australia into the, um, into the front line you know, from um, the, uh, this tokenized future that we are, are all here because we believe in it and are, are leaning into it right now. So thank you very much, everyone on the panel. It's been a delight to talk to you as ever. And um, um, round of applause for my beautiful panelists. Thank you.